general overview of the 2019 election. The key dates to know for our uh, purposes are September 24th is National Voter Registration Day. October 7th is the last day to register to participate in the 2019 election. October 8th is when early voting begins, and November 5th is Election Day. Uh, on the ballot this year, you'll find local judges, uh, local school boards, city government, and county government positions, as well as local ballot issues. Just to give you an understanding of the framework of how the election is actually administered, uh, the Secretary of State's office is the department that oversees Ohio election administration generally. Uh, if you are looking to contact someone with an election-related question, they are generally less uh, responsive than County Board of Elections. That's not due to any, you know, incompetence or anything like that. It's simply they cover the whole state, uh, so they have a little less uh, time to devote to individual questions and county concerns. They do, however, administer the MyOhioVote.com website, um, which contains pretty much everything and anything you can think of related to Ohio's election. Uh, that can be a little less intuitive to navigate. So we also have our own resource called ohvotes.org, and it should be able to help link you to some of those resources. The County Board of Elections is your local agency that oversees your local election. Uh, that is where you'll send any completed voter registration forms. They're generally more responsive than the Secretary of State because, of course, they are only uh, their jurisdiction is only your county. Um, but they set the early voting location, and usually the early voting location is at their Board of Election office, but this is not always the case. So prior to sending folks out to their early voting location, confirm where that site actually is. Um, they also will provide official forms in larger batches, as will the Secretary of State. So if you know you have a voter drive and you need you know, 100 uh, voter registration forms, you can request them from them, and you won't have to print them yourself. Um, but the quality of online resources will vary greatly by county, so especially the smaller counties might have a little uh, less robust of a website, so you might have to contact them directly as opposed to just browsing their online resources. So just to give you a little bit of information about the types of ballots, uh, so there are two main types of in-person voting. There's voting on election day and there's voting in person early. Uh, if you vote on election day, you will need to vote at your local precinct polling location, and you will need a proper ID. The hours will be 7.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m., but note that if you are in line by 7.30 p.m., that you do have the right to submit a ballot. So if um, I don't foresee problems uh, of huge lines at the polls this year, but this is something to keep in mind for 2020 when there might be a little bit more mayhem, uh, and especially if there's a circumstance where there is a uh, change in polling location, uh, or if there is a polling location with many, many precincts, there might be some delays uh, that make it more likely for that rule to be relevant. If you vote early in person, you won't be voting at your precinct polling location. You will be voting at your early voting location, which is usually, but not always, at the Board of Elections. Um, and you will also only need your license number or the last four digits of your Social Security number. You do not need a physical ID. But essentially, we now have in Ohio the ability to scan licenses um, to check people into voting. What that means is people might get to their early voting location and be asked for their driver's license. The reason they're being asked is so that those driver's license can be easily scanned in and they have an easy check-in process. That being said, if the voter says, no, I do not, they should still be able to vote um, the traditional way that is filling out a little envelope and um, voting right there, not provisionally. So the point being is that those voters who vote in person early might get asked for their driver's license directly. They are still not legally required to have that. Um, so that can lead to some confusion, but I do want to point that out uh, very explicitly so that if you come across that, you kind of have an idea of what happened. Um, so the types of ballots, there's also mail-in ballots. Um, mail-in and absentee ballots, uh, you can request them starting 90 days before the election. Uh, you, unfortunately, there are several steps with this. Um, so you have to still sign and mail an absentee ballot request form by November 2nd. Uh, that is the absolute deadline. I would say, though, for your own comfort uh, to request it as early as possible. 
uh, because of course, if you request it by November 2nd, you might only receive the absentee ballot um, on the day before election day, uh, in which case you have probably a 12 hour window to fill it out and submit it back. So um, the earlier you can submit that request, the earlier you can receive that ballot. Um, once you do receive the ballot, you can either mail it or drop it off to the Board of Elections. If you choose to mail it, it must be postmarked by Monday, November 4th to be counted. Um, so let's say that they don't mail it by November 4th. What's their best option? Their best option is going to be to literally drive it to the County Board of Elections on Election Day. Um, an alternative route is to vote provisionally at your assigned polling place. That means that the uh, ballot, once it is confirmed that you did not also submit your mail-in ballot, your provisional vote will be counted accordingly. Obviously, this is a little bit more of a headache for both the election administration as well as for you personally. So I would very much recommend the first option if possible. And as I mentioned previously and several times, an absentee ballot request form does not register someone to vote. Uh, and if the absentee ballot request is denied, um, the voter will probably not find out that they're not properly registered until after the registration deadline. Provisional ballots in general are the ballots that are used if a voter's eligibility is in question. They're most frequently cast on election day. Uh, the election officials then subsequently verify that the voter's eligibility to vote in that particular precinct at that election, and that vote will subsequently be counted once they have time to do that. Um, they will be begin reviewing those at seven days after the election, but they will all be counted eventually, at least those who are found to be properly eligible. Uh, those provisional ballots only require the last four digits of your social security number. So for instance, if you have a voter who does not have a physical ID, uh, they forget to vote early uh, and they are voting on election day, they will uh, by default be given a uh, provisional ballot and they will use those last four digits of their social to uh, complete that ballot. And then once it is verified that they are who they say they are, that vote will be processed. Technically, the rule is that a poll worker must check if a voter is eligible to cast a ballot at a different precinct prior to giving the voter a, a provisional ballot. So what this means is oftentimes there will be several different precincts at the same polling location. There's a precinct location and there's a polling location. Those are different uh, but coordinating things. So if you go to a polling location that has, let's say, five different precincts within it, uh, you might need to get in line A, B, C, D, or E, depending on which specific precinct you live in. Uh, so in theory, someone could be properly registered at precinct A, happen to pop into uh, the precinct B's line, and so when they get to that front of the line, they find out that they are not registered to vote in precinct B. Of course, the reason is that they are registered one, one table over, um, but technically, the poll worker is supposed to look at that prior to handing you a provisional ballot um, to see if there's somewhere else that you are properly registered to vote. That being said, they don't often do that. They might by default, especially if they're busy, just hand you a provisional ballot. Um, but you should know that if you are registered in, in precinct A and you vote in pre provisionally in precinct B, that provisional ballot will not be counted. There is legislation to fix this um, being proposed but it has not passed yet. So until that is uh, passed through, the rule is a provisional ballot cast outside someone's precinct, even if it's at the same polling location, that will not be counted. So make sure that as you're reaching out to voters and as you're voting yourselves, you're aware of this. Um, so if you do think that you should be properly registered and you're finding that your name's not in the poll book, um, make sure that you make sure that it's not in another poll book uh, down the street or even across the room prior to filling out that provisional ballot. Provisional ballots are used in early voting, specifically uh, if someone has moved within the state uh, and has not updated their address, or if they have moved or changed their name but failed to update the registration. Uh, that says October 9th, that should say October 7th. Um, election day, provisional ballots are used when either the name does not appear on the official poll list for that precinct, 
uh, the person does not have proper ID. Um, they have already requested an absentee ballot and therefore they need to confirm that that absentee ballot has not been submitted prior to uh, counting that election day vote. The name was purged unfairly from the rolls. Uh, the registration has been challenged. This could be uh, due to the signature not matching on the poll book or for um, you know someone not believing uh, because that you are not who you say you are then you might, uh, might be pushed into a provisional ballot. Um, or, of course, if your name has changed and the voter doesn't bring proof of that legal name change. All voting locations are required to be handicap accessible. Um, I want to note that Disability Rights Ohio operates a voter hotline every election day while the polls are open. Um, and, and every other business day, they have an intake department. Um, so you can leave a message and within 24 hours receive a response. Uh, and then on election day, you know, you can call them directly um, to ask about disability assistance. So if you're having a problem with voting specifically related to a disability, I uh, highly recommend calling them first. Voting locations are required to either have handicap accessible locations, so, you know, uh, ramps and uh, all of those ways that folks can get in and out at ease, uh, even if they have a wheelchair or some other physical handicap, um, or if they don't have a physical, physically accessible location, they need to uh, offer curbside voting, which means someone could actually stay in the car and the, uh, the uh, polling workers would actually come out, help that voter cast the ballot from their car so they don't have to go into the polling location. That being said, um, I have heard through the disability rights community that this, at this point, most if not all polling locations are handicap accessible and therefore you will rarely if ever see curbside voting actually happen. Uh, but do know that if there is for some reason a limited accessibility that they are required to offer that as a service. For ballot completion, if someone is incapable of filling out their ballot themselves, um, they may bring someone to help them. The only people who cannot help that voter vote are either an employer, a union agent, or a candidate for office. Uh, if you don't have someone who can help you, you can also request the help from two precinct election officials. Those will be two people from the major party, so one Democrat, one Republican, and they will uh, walk you through the ballot completion process. Uh, and also, precincts must have blind accessible voting machines. Um, if you are encountering any problems with any of these things, please call the uh, Disability Rights Ohio hotline so you can report that. Alternative voting options, if, suddenly, if someone is suddenly hospitalized, um, so if you or your minor child is suddenly finding themselves in the hospital for an unforeseeable medical emergency, you may apply uh, to vote by absentee. That request needs to be submitted by 3 p.m. on election day. If you are hospitalized in a different county, uh, then you can also request um, a, um, an absentee ballot um, to be sent to where you are actually um, currently for the hospitalization. But if this happens, we do recommend that you contact Disability Rights Ohio immediately to ensure that that process is followed and that you um, have access to all the rights that you legally have. There are individual barriers, but there's also systemic barriers to voting. Some of those systemic barriers include just generally oppressive rules. Um, so for instance, the ID requirements are very difficult for some folks. Uh, a lack of resources for either the polling location, so maybe there aren't enough poll workers to make the line go quickly. Um, maybe it is a lack of communication regarding a polling location change. Um, if there's any voting in, in cha changes in voting procedures, you can anticipate that there will be more questions and confusion on election day. Um, often this happens when uh, polling locations shift or ID requirements change. And you'll also find that there are under or wrongly trained poll workers. Again, this is frequently not a reflection of any um, malintent. It's largely, you know, due to either they misremember the rules or they're busy and they forget, you know, people, uh, poll workers are humans as everyone else, um, so the more aware you are of your rights, uh, the uh, more you can actually assert those rights and ensure that people aren't wrongly getting turned away from the polls or uh, gratuitously filling out provisional ballots, for instance. 
There's also individual barriers to voting. It might be due to a physical disability. It might be to a lack of transportation, uh, a lack of availability, um, problems with registration, or no proper ID. Um, so what we really uh, recommend folks do is to focus on eliminating as many of these barriers to voting as possible. Because of course, you don't want anyone's reason for not voting to be that they couldn't. Uh, election protection, there is a nonpartisan voter hotline. It's available 24-7. Uh, on non-election day, it might, you might get a call, a return call back, but on election day, it is staffed all day. Uh, there are, I have included the English, Spanish, and Chinese phone numbers. There are some other languages available. Uh, just for brevity's sake, I put um, only these three, but if you need a specific language, uh, it likely exists. And um, so you can find that specific language number to have uh, for your population. If people are looking to research their ballot, they can first look at vote411.org. That's the League of Women Voters website, which generates voter-specific voter guides. Um, that means you can plug in your uh, registration address, and they'll pull up what ballot you're going to have when you show up to the polls. Um, if you would like physical copies of the local voter guides, you'll need to reach out to your local League of Women Voters chapter to receive those. Also remember Google is your friend. Uh, things that are make for great resources for voters are local write-ups of elections, ballot issues, and candidates. Uh, so for instance, here in Columbus, the dispatch always does a few numbers on uh, each of the ballot issues as well as the candidates. Uh, and so you can share direct the voter towards those resources. Uh, you can also look at the campaign websites for the candidates and parties. Uh, again, you can often derive a lot of information about those candidates' values uh, just by uh, looking at what their focus is on the website. And then find the interest groups that you trust and support and look at what they're putting out regarding the election. So they might support or oppose a ballot issue. Uh, they might have specific commentary on a candidate's uh, position um, or otherwise uh, help inform that voter on what uh, candidates and parties best reflect their values. For early voting, we will offer scheduled group rides. So if you are with a nonprofit or if you have access to a group of people who want to uh, request a ride. So for instance, last year we worked with the YWCA who had a few uh, group voting times. So they had a sign-up sheet and anyone who wanted to vote uh, on Monday at 11 a.m., you know, sign up here. They then contacted us and said, hey, we have six riders ready to go for Monday at 11, can you get us drivers? And we will find that group drivers to take them to the polls. We will only do it with groups uh, until election day. And then on election day, we will have uh, the ability to have any individual call in and request a, a ride. Uh, they, of course, can schedule it ahead of time, but uh, what we've obviously found is a lot of people aren't really thinking about it until they are going to vote and realize they don't have transportation. Um, this is subject to uh, the availability of drivers in the area, which means the more drivers we recruit, the more voter rides capacity that we have. These are the rides to the polls phone numbers. Toledo is lucky enough to have its own acronym as they have Jobs with Justice is the organization that has been providing rides for uh, several years. Our phone numbers with local area codes, so at least folks will feel like they are, and they will be calling someone local to request the ride. Ohio-based voting resources. So if you have questions about different topics, I uh, would recommend sending you to different people. So if you have a question about disability voting, you can contact Kevin Truitt from Disability Rights Ohio. Questions about felony or in-jail voting, you can contact China Baldwin from All Voting is Local. Questions about the voter purge, contact Nazik Kabasha at uh, the League of Women Voters of Ohio. To request or get questions answered about the Fair Court Speakers Bureau, I recommend reaching out to Camille Wimbish of Ohio Voice. Uh, and then general voting rights programming, I would recommend reaching out to Rachel Coyle of the ACLU of Ohio. They have a variety of different voting resources and material. We also have regional leaders whose contact information is uh, listed here. If you do have specific questions or are looking for specific connections in your area, uh, these are the folks that are uh, step one to, to contact. So I will be the statewide contact. So if you are not in any of these areas, you can always reach out to me. 